to those who are present here and also to those who will then see this video through our Facebook channel, I'm going to share slides for my presentation. Everyone should be able to see now. To you alone, Most High, do they belong. I thought about the path we would take together this evening, starting from this expression found in the Canticle of the Creatures of St. Francis. Philosophy seems to me to be involved, and in particular those authors of philosophy that I am interested in and therefore in which I can recognize myself more easily, thanks to my studies so far, of ties and relationships compared to the poetic expression of Francis. I will give the floor to him right away because we want to start from him. We won't read the whole canticle of the creatures. The process has already begun and we are well aware of the text of Francis, but I would like to return to his textuality to indicate some things. To you alone, Most High, do they belong, and no human is worthy to mention your name. Praise be you, Lord, with all your creatures, especially Sir Brother Sun, who is the day, and through whom you give us light, and he is beautiful and radiant with great splendor, and bears the likeness of you, Most High One. Praise be you, my Lord. You sister moon and the stars, in heaven you form them, clear and precious and beautiful. Then the Lauda continues, and ends in the version that has been entrusted to us by the codes. Praise and bless my Lord, and give him thanks, and serve him with great humility. So I wanted to pick up on the text to bring our attention to the beginning of this lauda. Francis presents us three characteristics of God that are proper to God, in the sense that he does not share them with creatures. He is the Most High, an adjective often used by Francis in referring to God or the Son of God. Among the many expressions that we can find, I remember when in his testament Francis remembered his conversion, then the beginning of the initial fraternity, and says, the very high revealed to me that I had to live according to the Holy Gospel. So God is very high, he is omnipotent and he is good. These three characteristics distinguish him precisely from creatures that are small. I would say not omnipotent, because if I said impotent, I would be inaccurate. Because creatures do possess some power, but it is not the omnipotence of God, and they are good only in reference to goodness. They are not good in themselves, their goodness is in relation to the one who is inherently excellent. Similarly, Francis attributed these three characteristics to God, perhaps unconsciously, as if acknowledging a polarity, a distinct distance between God and creatures. For this reason alone is he deserving of praise. Thus, the song, as we recall, is not a celebration of the creatures themselves, rather it is a hymn directed to God to the creatures, as illustrated by the expressions I aimed to capture in this excerpt from the canticle. For the creatures are a means to praise God, dependent on Him. So the polarity expresses the opposition and the cross-reference at the same time, but also a kind of dependency. The creatures would not be if they were not dependent on the one who put them into being. The lauda then ends with the invitation to praise God. Actually, as I said earlier, it ends in the codes. In rereading and interpreting this lauda, the great Carlo Paolazzi recalls that the lauda are par excellence an open composition and are constantly reformulated. It is no coincidence that this same lauda was reformulated by Francis, who later added some parts, 
some steps to highlight events that had happened later than the initial writing and entrusting it to his friars so that it could be further elaborated. Reading the canticle of the creatures today would also mean that we ourselves invent new verses, because depending on the reality in which we live, we can praise God through the creatures, us and the creatures that surround us. For this reason, I feel authorized to make this philosophical comment to the canticle without betraying too much the spirit of Francis. Let me begin this by referring to two of his early biographers. First of all, Tommaso of Celano. Let us read this passage from the Vita Beati Patri Patris Nostri Francici, now known as Vita Brevio, about which I will later say a few words. Who could express the sweetness that flooded him? One speaks of Francis, evidently, when he contemplated in creatures the wisdom of the Creator, his power and his goodness. It was filled with a surprising joy, inexpressible, when he admired the sun and the moon, the stars and the firmament. He preached to flowers, woods, wood and stones as if they were righteous, meadows and vineyards, the beauty of the fields, the abundance of water from the sources, the greenery of the gardens, the earth, the fire, the air, the wind he admonished with naive innocence. He encouraged divine love as a means to foster genuine respect. He referred to all creatures as brothers and sisters, acknowledging the singular principle that unites them. This passage clearly resonates with the Canticle of the Creatures, showing, showcasing Francis's overarching attitude towards creation, creation, which manifests in three distinct actions. Firstly, there's contemplation and admiration. Secondly, there's preaching and exhortation. And finally, there's a focus on the phrase he indeed named all creatures for one principle with a fraternal name. Omnis denique creaturas propter unum principium fraternum nomine nominabat. In Thomas of Celano's interpretation, Francis' ecstatic gaze intertwines with an invitation to embrace the gospel message extended to all creatures. They are urged to listen to Francis's preaching and to praise God, recognizing their interconnectedness. This invitation is rooted in the understanding that the principle behind all creation is singular. They are brothers and sisters because they all originate from the same divine source, the Father. This passage was resumed almost verbatim a few years later by, by Giuliano da Spira. In La Vita Santi Francisca, Giuliano says, in the sun, in the moon, in the firmament, in the stars, in the various elements of nature, in their operations and beauties. How is it possible to say, in short, how much sweetness, how much grace of true knowledge he drew from contemplating in all things the power, wisdom and goodness of the Creator? I don't think any human can say this. And since he addressed all this at the only principle he could call everything by the name of brother, and therefore invited us in his loudest to praise the only creator. As you can see, similar expressions are repeated. Again, we have the interplay between three actions, albeit in different order. Note the expression also relating to their reticence to say, I do not believe that any mortal is able to say it. This impossibility to speak, that in the canticle is expressed rather as an impossibility of saying God, no human is worthy to mention your name. 
This takes me back to the lecture given at the seminar held by Mario Lupoli, who has already emphasized very well the apophatic aspect of the song. And I would like to briefly highlight the relationship between these two texts, Thomas and Julian. The so-called Vita Brevior, those of you who may not be informed in detail about uh, Francis's life, it is a recent discovery made by the great Franciscan historian Jacques Dallaran a few years ago. And for this reason it is called Vita Brevio, because it is considered a sort of abbreviation of Francis's life before. It could be placed chronologically between the so-called first life and the so-called second life of Francis, both written by Thomas of Chelan. Now, according to Jacques Dallaran's reconstruction hypothesis, Thomas wrote La Vita Prima in 1228-29 for the canonization of Francis, a life commissioned by Gregory IX. He would later write the Vita Brevior on behalf of Elia at the beginning of his adult life, around 1232. Giuliano da Spira, according to Thomas, wrote La Vita Santi Francesca between 1232 and 33, after the translation of Francesco's body, of which is reported in the life of Giuliano da Spira. Translation that took place in, 20, in 1230. And Giuliano also wrote the rhythmic office, which made him famous over the centuries, probably before La Vita. It's difficult to date these two works of Julian, the rhythmic office and La Vita, but in this case, in both works by Thomas. Alexander Orovsky, another great Franciscan Capuchin friar, disagrees with Jacques Dallaran's reconstruction and hypothesis an opposite dependence. Having written La Vita Prima, however, in 1229, commissioned by Gregory IX, La Vita Brevio, probably commissioned by Elijah at the conclusion of his generalate in 1238-39, Giuliano da Spira was the inspiration for the Vita Brevio in part because he wrote about his life between the Vita Prima and the Vita Brevio. Now, these are issues for uh, people who study Francis, which we perhaps do not care much about if we want to look at the doctrine or the expressions that strike us. I found it particularly striking <coughs> to witness the revival of the concept of the Unum Principium in both instances. This is evident in Thomas of Celano's phrase, he named all creatures with a fraternal name for one principle. As well as Giuliano's expression, he referred everything back to one principle. In both cases, the emphasis is on the idea that one principle encompasses everything. In these expressions by the two biographers, we see the, the, the resurgence of Francis's belief that only the Most High, only God, is truly supreme. He alone is the principle upon which everything relies. I believe we are justified in following this line of thought. The translation, or I might say the philosophical interpretation that we are about to delve into, is a resurgence of the understanding that the biographers captured by echoing Francis's poetic expressions. Using a botanical analogy, Francis's insight serves as the roots of the tree. The canticle of the creatures serves as the foundational root, evolving into a stem within the hagiographic tradition, particularly in these initial biographies of Francis. Subsequently, it branches out through the philosophical, metaphysical and theological interpretations provided by the Franciscan masters. One such interpretation is offered by Alessandro de Hales, 
Although it's worth noting that the Summa we are currently examining is a collaborative effort involving several individuals from the initial group of students around Alexander of Hales, who was the first Franciscan master in Paris. Regarding the question of whether the name of God can be used in the plural, Alexander's theme emphasizes its validity. They draw attention to the Cathars, who were prevalent in Italy and southern France at the time, often known as Albigensians. The Cathars believed in multiple principles, advocating for the existence of plural principles of creation. Given that God can be referred to as the principle, and thus the principle of all creatures, it would appear permissible for God to refer in the plural. This notion is reflected in an excerpt from another renowned text of the time at the University of Paris, the Summa Aurea, by William of Oxer, which is cited within the Summa Alensis. In this excerpt, we encounter a distinction. There are two types of names, some allowing for more than one referent, but of the same substance, such as sun and moon, and others allowing for more than one referent, but not of the same substance, like Socrates. This distinction underscores the complexity of theological and philosophical discussions surrounding the nature of God and the plurality of divine names. There's a rather intriguing passage, albeit somewhat dense, which warrants further exploration. It serves as a case in point to observe how the group surrounding Alexander engages with a question previously addressed in the Golden Sum, namely whether the term God and the principle of creatures can be used interchangeably and in the plural form. Within the distinction made between terms that allow for plural preaching, even if they don't inherently signify multiple entities, lies the discrepancy between God and the principle of creatures. Drawing on expressions from the background text of the Summa Aurea, subtly modified by the Summa Alensis, there emerge two categories of terms. Those that, while conceptually capable of being plural, are restrained by their object form being used as such, and those that inherently prohibit plural usage due to, due to their object. So, the second category pertains to God. The primary principle stands alone, as it might initially seem that there could be multiple principles. However, the conclusion drawn after this excerpt as presented by the Summa Lensis, asserts that while it may allow for speculation, true understanding, verus intellectus, prohibits the acceptance of multiple principles. Indeed, we could entertain the notion of multiple principles, but if we adhere to the truth of things, we must acknowledge that only one principle holds true, God. Bonaventura, perhaps Alexander's most prominent disciple, embarks on his journey, on this journey. He begins by invoking the first principle, the Eternal Father, for whom all enlightenment emanates, likening him to the Father of Light, the source of every excellent gift. He evokes the name of Jesus Christ, the Son, and our Lord, seeking illumination through the intercession of the Most Holy Virgin Mary, Mother of Christ, and Blessed Francis, our Father, so that our lives may be guided on the path of peace that surpasses human understanding. Bonaventura wrote L'Itinerarium during a period of reflection at Averna in 1259. One notable aspect is the literary device employed at the outset which doesn't quite translate smoothly into Italian. Sometimes these rhetorical nuances from the original text can be challenging to convey, to convey accurately. In the passage, the principle that is invoked at the very beginning, in principio primum principium, is closely tied to God, particularly emphasized through a quotation from the letter of James, chapter 1, verse 17, which describes God as the Father of Lights. The translation in the current version, C.A.C.A., reads, Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above and descends from the Father, Creator of Light.
per giungere in latin it reads a padre illuminum god is the father of illuminations the source of all light this fundamental principle underpins every intellectual cognitive and metaphysical aspect upon which reality is structured it is through him that we gain knowledge for he provides the light by which we comprehend reality throughout the journey depicted in literarium reality unfolds before us initially external then internal and ultimately transcendent leading us toward a state of complete communion with god that surpasses human comprehension this emphasizes once again the apophatic stance previously discussed echoing the sentiments of pseudo dionysus which are embraced by the franciscan tradition in the expression no human is worthy to mention your name Bonaventura also delves into the concept in the disputed issues of the Mysterius Trinitatis, which were composed roughly around the same time as the Itinerarium, albeit slightly earlier, around the years 1253 to 1257. In the first of these inquiries, Bonaventura probes whether God's existence is undeniable. He answer, his answer is affirmative. He presents three arguments to support his stance, with the second revolving around the notion of causation from creatures. He, elab he elaborates on ten arguments to establish, or rather to argue, for the existence of God with conviction. The first argument aligns closely with the topic under discussion. It posits that if there exists something that comes later, there must also be something that precedes it, as the former depends on the latter. Therefore, if all institutions come after a certain point, there must exist a primary entity. Thus, if we acknowledge the existence of before and after within creatures, we must also acknowledge that the entirety of creatures implies and proclaims a first principle. In Latin it reads, Necessi est universitatem creaturarum in ferre et clamarem primum principium. This makes me think of Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. I choose this passage because in my view, it encapsulates the polarity between God and creation, the sublime and the mundane the principle and its manifestations, more effectively than others. Bonaventura <coughs> treads a path, followed by many before him, a retrospective journey from phenomena to their ultimate source. Without a first cause, there would be no subsequent effects, no sense of direction. The existence of this principle provides assurance of the ontological trajectory of creation. This belief is deeply metaphysical, rooted in the traditional understanding of causal relationships and their objective significance. This may be a subject of debate, but classical metaphysics is steadfast in its belief that there exists an essential order among things. Another metaphysical inclination, we might argue, is the impossibility of the infinite regress in, in the search of an uncaused cause. Without the existence of a first cause, the alternative would lead to absurdity. In a more immediate sense, one might find Nietzsche's perspective in reading. Ultimately, it suggests that the significance and value of a thing loses meaning in the absence of direction. The absolutization of what lacks rationality is synonymous with a lack of direction. I must mention John Duns Scaltus, who initiates the discussion on the first principle due to time constraints. I only managed to read the first sentence. However, this opening sentence forms the entire beginning, structured in accordance with the, a grand invocation that encompasses various other aspects and moments of the treaty. While this elaboration could be and could be deemed synthetic, 
It is nevertheless a widely recognized feature of rational theology. John Dan Scotus wrote the treaty on the first principle during his tenure as a master regent in Paris. This place, this places it in the early years of the 14th century be, between the years 1300 and 1304, with the aim of providing his students with a concise argument for the rational proof of God's existence. The treaty commences with a call to action. <clears throat> Although I haven't delved into whether there are explicit, explicit references, the resonance is too strong to ignore the possibility that Scotus might have referenced the itinerarium in some manner. It is likely that he was familiar with the beginning of the itinerarium. itinerarium. The first principle of all things <clears throat> allows me to believe, to understand or to enjoy, to express, to proclaim what is Majesty desires and to evaluate our minds to contemplate him. In Latin it says primum rerum principium mihi es credere proferre conceda. The term knowing can readily be translated as understanding or grasping the intellectual aspect. However, it also encompasses the notion of experiencing of, or tasting, as suggested by the Italian translators Porro and Scapin. I wish to emphasize this expression as it illustrates why John Duns Scotus also characterizes God through this attribute, his primacy, as the first being and the principle of all things. This significance is so profound that it becomes the very title of his treaty, the Treaty of the First Principle. This implies, as John Dunn Scotus elucidates throughout his treaty, that there exist fundamental connections among things based on orders of efficiency, purpose and eminence. These casual and eminence orders invariably point towards a singular necessary first principle unique because of all reality viewed through the various aspects of these essential orders comprises the totality of existence. Thus the singular reality serves as the foundation for all three orders. Consequently, the first principle is singular in each order. However, across all three, efficiency, eminence and purpose, there exists a, new, a unified principle. This concept encompasses the limit of what both our faith and intellect can comprehend, requiring faith to grasp what our knowledge alone cannot fully fathom. This notion is evident in the passage presented here. The fact that Scotus commences his rational theological treaty with an invocation, it's significant, as it reflects his belief that arguing about God is only possible within this framework. He ultimately concludes that one of God's defining characteristics in relation to creatures is his infinitude. Additionally, there's another aspect, less emphasized by other authors, which concerns the infinitude of God in relation to the finitude of creatures. Our last reference is to Raymond Lullus. Although not strictly a Franciscan, Lullo is associated with the Franciscan spiritual tradition, particularly with the Franciscan lay people who adhered to Francis' spirituality during the 13th and 14th century. Lullo wrote Ars Compendiosa Dei in 1387 in Montpellier. This work represents one of many reworkings by Raymond Lullo of his methodical, mathematical and logical approach, wherein he believed all disciplines converge to reveal truth and affirm the superiority of the Catholic faith to non-believers, as they were termed at the time. Here is an excerpt from Distinction 25, which delves into a topic of creation. The first part examines the principle of creation, particularly focusing on preaching creation through principles and distinctions. Lulo discusses 
21 ways to preach God as creator. And the 13th way states, God is creator, the first existing principle. This translation is my own interpretation, as the Latin read reads existence primum principium, which can be rendered as the first principle that exists, or exists as the first principle. According to Lullo, the first principle's act of creation was the reason behind the creation of all other creatures. Thus, in contemplating the humanity of Christ, the first creative principle is observed, known and loved through its, its effects. By contemplating, knowing and loving all creatures, we recognize the effects of the first principle as articulated by Lullo. One significant aspect highlighted in the discussion is Christ himself, particularly his humanity. In essence, this presents a Christological perspective on creation, aligned with Christian revelation, which asserts that God created everything in and through Christ. Thus, Christ can be seen as the efficient, exemplary and final cause of reality. Scriptural support for this view can be found in Genesis 1 and John 1, 1 to 3. The opening of Genesis parallels the beginning of John's prologue with God created the heavens and the earth, corresponding to in the beginning was the word and the word was with God, establishing a chronological connection between the two accounts. We can also adhere closely to Augustine's interpretation of Genesis, which reflects a broader tradition found in patristic writings. When interpreting scripture, we must consider both its figurative and literal senses. So, what does it mean when it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth? It could refer to the commencement of time, indicating that they, they were created before all else. Or it could signify the word of God, his only son, as the beginning. However, emphasizing in the beginning, highlights the chronological aspects more prominently. Saying in the beginning implies that God creates at, creates at the outset, at what is known as the Greek arche, or principle. Both the Septuagint translation and the original version of John <coughs> use an arche, which can be translated as in the beginning or at the beginning. This aligns with what Paul conveys in his letter to the Colossians. He, the Son, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers and authorities, all things were created through him and for him. I'm not certain if I'm stretching the text of Colossians too far, but the phrase in him suggests exemplary casualty, causality. Through him implies efficient causality, and for him denotes final causality. He is the beginning of all things, and everything exists in him. As I mentioned earlier, we arrive at the conclusion initiated by the eminent Bonsignore that God's transcendence is beyond our full comprehension. However, his transcendence does not disconnect him from us. Rather, by defining him in terms of his exalted nature, juxtaposed with our lowliness and relationship, is, a relationship is established, a correlation that flows from us to him as we are derived from him, but also from him to us. This is not to suggest that he depends on us for his existence, but rather he chooses to engage in a relationship with us. This perspective, even within the, the context of Christology, underscores the significance of his relationship with us, evident in his gift of his son. If we accept this interpretation, then creation itself occurs within the son, and consequently within the realm of the Son's humanity, pointing towards the foreseen incarnation of the Son as the culmination of the creative process. In such a scenario, the Most High draws remarkably near. However, this veers more into the realm of faith, and we set it aside for now, 
it strikes me that even in philosophy's attempt to grasp God, the principle of all things as the origin, the notion of the principle being in principle, implies that understanding is only possible through the relationship established with it. This is because all effect, effects emanating from God are not only related to him, but also interconnected with each other. This is precisely what Francis perceives with his advocacy of, for universal brotherhood. Similarly, philosophically, we comprehend entities not as isolated realities, but as intricately interconnected with one another. With that, I conclude my discussion which aims to provide some insights inspired by the teachings of the Franciscan masters. As I mentioned earlier, just as the Lauda is an open composition, I hope our discussion tonight remains open as well, allowing space for your thoughts and considerations. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to continuing our dialogue.